Tesla shareholder meeting live cast 2021. You guys, what? Hey, quick, give me a thumbs up if you can actually hear me. I hope you can. I trust you can. Uh, yeah, that should be great. Now I will need to, of course, go over here and mute this. Mute it. Mute it. Perfect. Okay. Live streaming. Howdy. Okay. So we've got a few things to talk about. Uh, I should mention that I'm Brian, and uh, welcome to my Tesla weekend. Yes, hello, here we are. So what a day. Um, Tesla finished the day up, you know, a little bit. Not bad. Stonks, by the way, they go up. That's what they do. So let's jump over here. Um, I wanted to talk about the questions that were submitted by investors on say. And by the way, I'm not doing the usual one minute delay on the live stream. That's something that I did, um, that I like to do uh, when uh, the news isn't critically timely. This is critically timely. We must have fresh data. So if it lags at all, you can blame whoever's in charge of Starlink because that's a what I'm using. So let's take a look here. And by the way, um, we're going to be doing some theories and some actual answers on say. We're going to then be actually just watching the live stream when it comes up, which is exciting and great. And then afterwards, we'll discuss it. So have your questions ready. And jump over here. Make sure we got some thummies. Oh, look at that. Nice. So they're already teasing. That's great. Put this right here so when it is live, we can see it. In the meantime, boy, that's a little loud. Let me turn that down. Okay, I'll keep it in the background. Ah, we'll mute it. We'll mute it. Let me know if you see it and I'm missing it, uh, but I'm gonna mute it. So let's look at the say questions. Oh, again, howdy, howdy. Welcome all. In If meeting your long-term volume targets requires price reductions, will you do it? And the answer has already been provided. The answer is yes, of course they will. Um, we want to make our cars more affordable and we're gonna. Uh, what they don't say in the answer here um, is that uh, there's, no, there, there's a huge benefit to not making them affordable when demand is as exceptionally high as it is. Anyone who's ever ridden in a Tesla or driven a Tesla is more likely to buy one. So the more of them that sell, the more demand seems to be going up, and that's pretty awesome. But here's the thing, if you're selling a half million cars, which they did last year, and you up the price a thousand bucks, what is that, an extra 500,000, uh, 500, uh, let's add some zeros there, what is that, 50, 500 million, it's a half billion dollars? And if you're coming into a run rate of a million cars at a thousand dollars, that's a billion dollars in extra money. A billion dollars is about what Giga Shanghai phase one cost. And if they could afford to build another phase one type Giga factory each year that the price stays up by a thousand, they're gonna do it. They gonna do it. As a bridge to the ride hailing network, could you leverage the insurance product to give customers the ability to rent out their vehicles via the app, enabling the car to make more money for them, like a proprietary version of Turo? The answer, um, I think we're going to focus on enabling the robo-taxi. Just basically, yeah, just that. That's just a small subset of the overall robo-taxi your car thing. Um, it's a lot of work. Setting up something like Turo is a lot of work. And especially if you're going to be competing against your own customers at some point, it's tough. It's a tough balancing act. But setting up something like Turo, there's critical mass involved. If you don't have enough cars in enough areas, it just doesn't work. Counting on them to definitely make their cars available could frustrate customers if you don't have enough. And Tesla just doesn't have the surplus units available to sell. Residential energy use accounts for roughly the same magnitude of carbon. Today's boilers, blah, blah, blah. Are you bringing HVAC to homes soon? Well, the answer is yes, we agree. Yes, we're gonna. But that's the, that's the official answer. Would you like to hear 
uh, the real answer. Retrofitting homes with a octavalve or super bottle type system would be extremely difficult and expensive. It would be prohibitive. Um, outfitting new homes with something like that, though, that's more doable. But it's a smaller market. So uh, Elon says, absolutely, like the heat pump in the car, being able to use the battery, uh, you know, we could use the hot water tank of the house for this purpose. Yeah, there's, there's opportunity there, but it's down the road. At what point do you have enough? Do you expect to have enough internal or external battery capacity to start ramping up stationary storage deployments again? So uh, I'm not sure if this is meant to mean um, Mega Pack or Powerwall. In terms of Mega Pack, they're already ramping. They've they've broken ground on a new factory. Uh, that's a gonna happen. That's underway. Um, as far as Powerwalls, I've heard quite a bit of people who are quite frustrated with the wait time so i don't i don't know i hope so as the lithium iron phosphate uh patent expires which is happening any minute like next month or in the next few months they should be able to switch to something that's uh more robust and less energy dense than lithium ion like they have in the uh standard range um sr pluses in china and now in america because um weight isn't as critical in your garage as it is in your car. With the current rollout of FSD beta, what are the main hurdles on the road to level four? Man, all of them, all of them. Will you design a separate vehicle specifically for use in a robo taxi role or for example, Vegas Loop? Boy, I hope that the platform they build for the Vegas Loop ends up being the cargo van or the RV, you know, the small RV. I know someone like Dave Lee would love to get his hands on something that's purpose built to the dimensions of a, of a boring tunnel. So I hope that comes, but I don't know. And the hurdles to level four <clears throat> remain all of them, all of them. The fact that no one is there yet should speak to the absolute difficulty of it. Manufacturing is hard, delays happen. What contingencies do you have in place to ensure the bottlenecks you might encounter while ramping internal cell production do not preclude your ability to hit your Model Y targets in Berlin and Texas? And an answer has been provided. Ha! Ah, we're trying to de-risk 2021 so that we're not reliant on the 4680s, but in 2022, they hope to have them up and that it'll work. Uh, to de-risk the manufacturing itself, that was one of the reasons why we located our pilot facility in Fremont. And as Elon pointed out, uh, it will be the pilot plant alone is within the top 10 cell factories on Earth. So that's a that's substantial. So that's that's your answer there. Um, the longer answer, my answer is, they buying batteries from everybody all the time. I suspect the Plaid was supposed to have 4680s, and it was delayed because they couldn't get them done, because they couldn't get there. But they will. Um, with regards to Wright's Law, at what volume production is the 56% cost decline for batteries expected? at the full three terawatts or at lower volumes. I don't have a good answer to this, but my suspicion is they don't have a good answer either. It's a combination of factors. Um, different components can go down in price at different times, and they're not always necessarily dependent on each other. And for those of you just tuning in, uh, I will be just showing the live stream when it's up, but I will have notes at the top of the screen, uh, and you won't have to endure my, my pretty mug and I'll turn my mic off. So that'll be, that'll be, that'll be great. And then afterwards we'll have a Q&A where we go through all the questions. Can you please discuss with us the price margin debate in more detail as volumes start to ramp? Will you cut price to expand volumes further and maintain a competitive advantage? Of course they will. Of absolutely course they will. Of course they will. Why would they not? Do you think they're going to stop 
selling as many cars as they possibly can. The fact that they've increased the price so many times and their margin is so fat should tell you they've got room to bring that price back down again to control demand and pull that lever as needed to just make more sales. They can also move cars um, to uh, make more and just have them available as inventory for folks who simply won't wait a month or three to get a car. A lot of people want to, to buy a car now or have to. Maybe their car suddenly died or was in an accident. They need a car. Can't wait three months. Can't rent for three months. It's not cost effective. Can you help us better understand the key milestones required to reach a profitable $25,000 car, battery cost reduction, cost reduction versus additional manufacturing efficiencies? It's all that. <clears throat> the front and rear casting is going to save money. The reduced size and weight means less material. That's going to save money. The reduced size and weight also means a smaller battery pack. That reduces cost. The structural battery pack does it too. Now the only question is, can they get the whole shell on there? And one obstacle they're coming up against is the FSD suite costs the same whether it's going into a, a, a plaid or a $25,000 car. So hopefully that continues to scale and reduce prices, but we shall see. Costs, I meant. I'm going to jump over the chat real quick and make sure I haven't like muted myself or anything ridiculous. So good. So good. Hello, all my friends. I will address you later. Hello, all of you. Okay. I don't know what I was doing over here. Oh, yes, this. Okay. What are the incremental steps from FSD beta to full Tesla network launch? What is stopping you from launching a human-driven ride hail service now ahead of the FSD release to all owners? Um, so the ride hailing service is a monumental undertaking. And that would require a whole division with a, a ton of people who would have to be amazing, trained, vetted, all that. They've got a lot on their plate. I think that's a low priority. But incremental steps from FSD beta to full network launch. Boy, I don't know the answer to that one. I don't know the answer to that one. Can you talk a bit about the progress of the virtual power plant in Australia? When do you think we'll start to see an international expansion of it in other countries? Already. It's already happening. There's one in the UK. There's one in Hawaii. There's one in Alaska. There's, uh, they're everywhere. Not everywhere, but they'll be everywhere soon enough. There's one in Texas that Tesla owns themselves. They gonna keep the gravy off that one. What kind of time frame might we expect for Tesla to begin licensing software and supplying battery trains and power and batteries, powertrains and batteries to other automakers? Boy, uh, I would say eight to 10 year horizon. It's still pretty far out. Right now, a lot of the OEMs, the legacy auto companies, honestly believe that they can do this all on their own. They're not yet at the point where they understand the scale of the challenge, the absolute difficulty of the problem. And as they get there, well, Tesla makes their own seats and none of the other guys do. So maybe they'll start buying from Tesla. Mercedes and Toyota were early partners and were hoping to get technology from Tesla that they could use to make their cars. And they both just kind of changed their minds. Although Mercedes uh, took an ownership stake in Tesla and made so much money. Although a small fraction of what they would have made if they'd have just held. So they, um, <clears throat> I don't know, I think it's pretty far down the road. Right now Tesla is viewed as, as the competition and you just don't want to help the competition if possible. <clears throat> Although that can change, you know. Um, a lot of American-made cars, like the uh, like the uh, Chevy Sprint, was actually a Geo Metro that was just rebadged. So, uh, and a lot of times, car makers will buy whole engines from other companies or whole transmissions from other companies just because it works. Given strong for your demand for your vehicles, excess capital, and a large storage market, how fast could you accelerate the rollout of new gigafactories beyond? Berlin, China, Texas. How soon can you bring on the next factory? 
Now you're in my wheelhouse. My suspicion is that once Texas and Berlin are wrapped up, they will begin work on two more. Now, that might just be expansions of Berlin and Texas, but it could be other locations as well. And regardless, it's going to be, you know, um, a year and a half-ish from an announcement slash groundbreaking until it's done. Um, Giga Berlin was, uh, Giga Shanghai was quicker because um, the phase one was very small and... Uh, Mostly one story. It was an easy line to build. Oh, it's time. Let's go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tesla's 2021 annual We would like to introduce you to this My name is Martin Dick, and I'm Tesla's senior director of industrial relations. There will be two parts of today's meeting. First, the formal part of the meeting will cover the nine items that stockholders have, uh, have been asked to vote on. After the voting, I will introduce Tesla's co-founder and CEO, Elon Musk, who will give a presentation about Tesla's year in review. At this time, I'd like to thank the members of the Tesla team and board who are with, here with us today. A representative from PricewaterhouseCoopers, Tesla's independent auditor, is present on the phone with us as well. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to Robin Denholm, the chair of Tesla's board, who would like to say a few words. Thanks, Martin. Well, welcome to the 2021 annual shareholders meeting here in virtual form this year. Um, we hope next year that we'll be able to have our regular in-person gathering just like we have over the last decade. Since we last met as a shareholder group in September of 2020, a lot has happened at Tesla. I want to just recap some of the things that have happened over this last 12 months. So in the 12 months that ended September of 2021, we've delivered over 800,000 vehicles. We've also started new production lines in Shanghai. We've commenced the pilot production of our own in-house battery cells. And on top of that, we've constructed two new gigafactories on two different continents, including the one that we're here today in, in Texas. But maybe most importantly, our mission of accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy remains at the center of what we do. Over the last 12 months, Tesla has continued to help shift the public perception of electric vehicles. And it wasn't too long ago that many people were still questioning the future of EVs. I would say that today that's no longer the case. There is no doubt that the transition to uh, sustainable transportation and the transportation industry is turning electric. In many places around the world, you can't drive down the street without seeing many Teslas, which to me is an incredibly proud thing and a, a testament to our progress. While our performance to date has surpassed many common expectations, we believe that we're only at the beginning of what the long journey ahead that we have. As we disclosed in our impact report this year, by 2030, we are aiming to sell 20 million electric vehicles per year and deploy 1,500 gigawatt hours of energy storage per year. Our mission is clear. The automotive sector and the energy sector have to become fully electric. There's no question about it. While producing and selling half a million cars in the last calendar year is more than most expected, we need to continue to grow exponentially to create a true impact for the planet and for our shareholders. I also want to acknowledge that Tesla's achievements so far and our future aspirations would simply not be possible without, without the unrelenting efforts of our amazing employees. Each and every one of them who globally now number almost 100,000 
are doing everything that they can every day in the name of our mission. While our, while our investors might recognise some, of, a handful of Tesla executives or directors, we know that Tesla's success is due to the creativity, the ingenuity and the sheer hard work of our tens of thousands of employees globally. As we expand into a truly global manufacturer, we are committed to making sure that we employ, grow and retain people with a passion for what we do and are aligned with our mission and our values and culture globally. I also want to acknowledge and thank my fellow Tesla board members who have been unwavering in their commitment to Tesla to help grow, guide and evolve the company and its governance practices. And I especially want to call out and thank Antonio Gracias as this will be his last shareholder meeting as a board member after 14 years of unrelenting support and being on the board. He's made a significant part of Tesla's journey and a key member of the board for all of those years. Antonio, we appreciate everything that you've done for the company and we will miss you. And lastly, I wanted to say thank you to you, all of our shareholders. You are an intrinsic part of our journey and this unique journey. We're proud to say that our shareholder base is probably the most committed, most active and most engaged base I've ever seen. Thank you for spreading the word for us, for being with us through our ups and downs. And we wouldn't be here or where we are today without your support and we are focused on continuing to deliver to our mission and for you for many years to come. And so now I will hand it over back to Martin, who's the chair of our meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I will now call meeting to order. Please refer to the meeting agenda that is posted on our virtual meeting site. The time is now 4.36 p.m. Central Time, and I declare that the polls are now open. We have already received over the past few weeks voting proxies from our stockholders, meaning that almost all of the votes that will be counted were already submitted before this meeting. However, if you wish to vote your shares or change your prior vote, you may do so through the virtual meeting site. Tesla's board of directors has appointed Computer Share Trust Company to serve as an inspector of election for this meeting. Computer Share has taken a signed an oath as an inspector of election and has certified that starting on August 26, 2021, the proxy materials or a notice of internet availability of the proxy materials were mailed or provided to all Tesla stockholders of record as of August 9th, 2021. We have a majority of all the outstanding shares represented at the meeting, so I declare that there is a quorum present and that we may proceed with the meeting. This, uh, the items on the agenda are as follows. Number one. The election of two class two directors, James Murdoch and Kimball Musk, to serve for a term of two years. Number two, to adopt amendments of our certificate of incorporation to reduce director terms to two years. Number three, to adopt amendments to our certificate of incorporation and bylaws to eliminate applicable supermajority voting requirements. And number four, to ratify the appointment of PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP as Tesla's independent registered public accounting firm for the fiscal year 2021. Tesla's board has recommended that our stockholders vote for each of the director nominees and for proposals two and four. We have also received five stockholder proposals as described in our proxy statement. I would like to remind our stockholders that Tesla's board has prepared a statement in opposition to each of these proposals, which appeared in our proxy statement. The first stockholder proposal is an advisory vote regarding reduction of director terms to one year. 
our board has recommended that our stockholders vote against this stockholder proposal. The stockholder proposal is proposed by James McRitchie, who is on the line to present this proposal. Mr. McRitchie, I would like to invite you to speak. You will have three minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Almost 90% of the 500 Fortune 500 companies are bored. And are widely viewed corporate governance best. The annual election of each directors more accountable contribute to improve performance company value. Here's what a one point said when they have their vote in advance. Shareholders should be able to participate and frequently frequent elections of all board members, preferably on an annual basis. This proposal should also be evaluated in the context of Tesla's overall corporate governance. Shareholders cannot hold special meetings, act by written consent, nominate directors through proxy access. At our 2020 annual meeting, 56% of shares voted in favor of my advisory proposal eliminating supermajority requirements. The board is now letting you vote to repeal those supermajority requirements through proposal number four. However, notice the board takes no position on this measure. That probably means Elon Musk and his inner circle are voting against it. Without this measure obtaining a 67% approval rating, neither the board's proposal to move to two-year terms or mine to move to one-year terms will pass. This is essentially a way for the board to look like they want to increase the frequency of elections without actually doing it. Our company's technology is second to none. Our company's corporate governance should meet the same high standards. Vote for proposal number five. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McRitchie. The second stockholder proposal is an advisory vote regarding additional reporting on diversity and inclusion efforts. Our board has recommended that our stockholders vote against this stockholder proposal. The stockholder proposal by Calvert Research and Management, whose representative Kimberly Stokes is on the line to present the proposal. Ms. Stokes, I would like to invite you to speak. You will have three minutes. Thank you. Tesla states in its 2020 Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Report that it is on a mission to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. We at Calvert Research and Management heartily support this effort and understand how important it is to invest in companies that are leading the charge to a net zero economy. However, we also know that it takes human resources to achieve these goals and ask Tesla to demonstrate how the company's human capital management strategy, and specifically its diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, supports the level of innovation and collaboration necessary to achieve this goal. The business case for diversity is clear. Numerous studies demonstrate the benefits of a diverse corporate workforce. These include better financial returns, superior stock performance, and importantly, Research shows that diverse and inclusive teams support more innovation. Tesla's 2020 DEI report lacks sufficient quantitative and qualitative information for investors to adequately compare the company's performance over time and relative to peers. What the report does reveal is that Tesla's leadership is 83% male and 59% white, despite having what the company describes as a majority-minority workforce all at a time in which, in which Tesla's customer base is evolving and growing more diverse. Calvert asks that Tesla's reporting include the process the board follows for assessing the effectiveness of the company's DEI programs and the results of that assessment. We also ask that Tesla disclose its full EEO-1 report, a comprehensive breakdown of Tesla's workforce by race and gender according to 10 employment categories which is already collected and provided to the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission every year. In its DEI report, Tesla states, 
we do the work required to ensure that our culture is as diverse and inclusive as it is collaborative and driven. However, in order to fully understand whether or not Tesla is executing well on its stated strategy, the company must be more transparent about its policies and practices and do the work to provide investors with reliable, consistent, and comparable data that we need to make informed investment decisions. We acknowledge that Tesla is committed to integrating DEI reporting into the company's annual impact report, but want the board to understand that Tesla's disclosure lags far behind peers. In 2020, Calvert analyzed the top companies held in our core portfolio. At that time, less than 20% were disclosing EEO1 data, including Tesla. Following our engagement, 70% of these companies have committed to disclosing their full EEO1 report on an annual basis. As shareholders, we are concerned that Tesla's lack of focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion could hinder the company's ability to innovate in the future. We urge the board to commit to full disclosure rather than incremental ineffective action. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stokes. The third stockholder proposal is an advisory vote regarding reporting on employee arbitration. Our board has recommended that our stockholders vote against this stockholder proposal. This stockholder proposal is proposed by NIA Impact Capital, whose representative, Christine Hall, is on the line to present the proposal. Dr. Hall, I would like to invite you to speak. You will have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, this is Kristen Hall. Can you hear me? I am Dr. Kristen Hall, founder and CEO at NIA Impact Capital. On behalf of NIA and our co-filers, I formally move Proposal 7. This resolution requests that Tesla's board of directors oversee the preparation of a report on the impact of the use of mandatory arbitration on Tesla employees and on its overall workplace culture. Why is this report needed? After this week's headlines and many other employee allegations of racial discrimination, we as investors need a look under the hood. The use of mandatory arbitration limits employees' remedies when it comes to both harassment and discrimination. Precluding employees from suing in court, often keeping underlying facts, misconduct, and case outcomes secret, these clauses may allow harassment and discrimination to continue, hidden from other employees and from investors. Bias, discrimination, and harassment in the workplace create unknown and uncompensated risks for investors, inviting unnecessary legal, brand, financial, and human capital issues to a company. On the flip side, the benefits of a positive and inclusive company culture with diverse teams include access to top talent, better understanding of consumer preferences, fewer blind spots when it comes to leadership decisions, more informed strategy discussions, and improved risk management. A diverse workforce and the different perspectives it encourages has also been shown to produce more creative and innovative workplace environments. Of particular relevance to Tesla, research shows a strong link between diversity and revenue from innovation, where companies with above average diversity produce significantly greater revenue from innovative products or services than those with below average diversity. Many technologies with which Tesla may compete for recruitment and hiring, such as Adobe, Airbnb, Google, IBM, Intel, Lyft, Microsoft, Salesforce, and Uber, no longer use these policies. Tesla simply cannot rest on its laurels, assuming its first mover advantage will last. Given the allegations raised by over 100 past employees, these racial slurs, discrimination in promotions, a retaliatory culture, and lack of response from human resources, investors are counting on Tesla to step up and make human capital management a priority. Tesla is a known leader in innovation, and it's time now for Tesla to also lead when it comes to promoting a fair and inclusive workplace. Tesla's board is asked again to complete the requested report to determine if mandatory employee arbitration is in the best interest of Tesla, its employees, and its shareholders. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. 
The fourth stockholder proposal is an advisory vote regarding assigning responsibility for strategic oversight of human capital management to an independent board level committee. Our board has recommended that our stockholders vote against this stockholder proposal. This stockholder proposal is proposed by Comptroller of New, uh, the City of New York, whose representative Michael Garland is on the line to present the proposal. Mr. Garland, I would like, you to, I would like to invite you to speak. You will have three minutes. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Denholm, board members, and fellow shareholders. The New York City pension funds are long-term Tesla shareholders with roughly 1.3 million shares re representing nearly a billion dollars of capital at risk. Our proposal calls on the board to assign responsibility for strategic oversight of human capital management to an independent board committee that will, one, review corporate policies and practices on principal strategy and management of workforce-related matters including those related to addressing workforce equity and inclusion and compensation for employees other than executive officers. Two, oversee the extent to which Tesla's policy standards and requirements are applied consistently across its operations. And three, offer guidance on strategic decisions that may have an impact on the workforce. Investors are increasingly focused on the essential role that effective human capital management plays in creating long-term shareholder value and to the material risks created by poor human capital management practices, such as those exhibited by Tesla. That four of the five shareholder proposals at today's meeting focus on worker and human rights should serve as a wake-up call to the board. Under new SEC disclosure rules, companies are expected to include human capital measures and objectives that the company focuses on in managing the business. Many boards, including at Ford and GM, have signaled greater attention to human capital management by defining explicit oversight responsibilities in, com in committee charters. In pro opposing Proposal 8, the board claims that independent board committees already perform the requested functions. The board highlights the role of its compensation and audit committees play in overseeing workforce management and workforce issues. However, neither the compensation nor the audit committee list these responsibilities in their charters or in the proxy statement. According to its charter, the compensation committee's responsibilities are limited to compensating executive officers and board members and administering the company's employee benefit plans. <clears throat> Finally, in opposing our proposal, the board also asserts that our supporting, statements re supporting statement references one-sided allegations from media headlines lacking context and facts, and that we are drawing speculative conclusions from them. Let me now delineate some facts that underscore the need for the requested board responsibilities. In March of this year, the National Labor Relations Board upheld an earlier ruling that Tesla acted unlawfully when it fired a union activist, interrogated and disciplined workers, issued a new restriction in response to workers exercising their labor law rights, and by threatening workers against, threatening workers against unionizing via a tweet from C CEO Elon Musk. And just this week, a jury ordered Tesla to pay $137 million to a former worker over racist treatment. Unlike other Tesla employees who allege racial discrimination, the plaintiff was exempt from the company's mandatory arbitration policy that is the subject of Proposal 7 and able to pursue his case in federal court. Our fundamental concern is that Tesla's weak labor management practices pose material risks to the company's exponential growth. We expect the independent directors we elect to provide the oversight necessary to protect the long-term interests of the company, its employees, and its shareholders. We urge shareholders to vote for Proposal 8. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garland. Thank you. Thank you. The fifth stockholder proposal is an advisory vote regarding additional reporting on human rights. Our board has recommended that our stockholders vote against this stockholder proposal. This stockholder proposal is proposed by Sisters of the Good Shepherd New York province, whose representative Winifred Dorothy is on the line to present the proposal. Ms. Dorothy, 
I would like to invite you to speak. You will have three minutes. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I am Winifred Doherty, a member of the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, a global international congregation of Catholic sisters and partners in mission. Today, I represent the Sisters of Good Shepherd New York as shareholders and the project participants of Bon Pasteur in the cobalt mines around Kuwezi in the Democratic Republic of Congo. A similar human rights proposal filed by the sisters received nearly 25% investor support last year. And we again urge all Tesla shareholders to support Proposal 9, which requests that the Board of Directors commission an independent third-party report assessing the extent to which Tesla is effectively fulfilling its responsibilities to, in respect to human rights and engagement in responsible sourcing practices. Today, I challenge the Tesla board and shareholders to apply the same efficacy, efficiency, and high st quality standards to the supply chain, from source to factory to showrooms, where Tesla's ingenuity and creativity excel in its latest models, which delight the consumer. 2021 is the international year for the eradication of child labor. The UN Agenda for Sustainable Development seeks to end child labor in all its forms by 2025. Under the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, Tesla has a responsibility to respect human rights within company-owned operations and through their business relationships, including suppliers. Pope Francis, in May 2019, urged that mining be at the service of the human person and their inalienable fundamental human rights, not vice versa. Having human rights compliance at the center of your activities we ask that you acknowledge the harm done to people and planet through your current. Thank you, Thank uh, you. Through your uh, current organizational model and recognize that today's world urgently needs social and environmental sustainability, demanding a balance of economic growth and holistic well being of people and planet. We invite you to join initiatives to advocate for better regulation and a just enforcement of existing laws by all duty bearers. Ensure all supply chains are ethical with zero tolerance of child labor. Implement just working conditions, safety, fair wages and hours for each and every person within the company. Support with funding local initiatives that promote a sustainable and diversified economic development at the upstream of the supply chain. And finally, complete the final rights assessment requested by Proposal 9. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dorothy. Please note that this is the final opportunity to submit any proxies for them to be counted. I declare the polls are now closed. Based on the proxies that we have previously received, I'd like to announce on a preliminary basis that our stockholders have approved the recommendations of the Tesla board on all agenda items except item two, regarding the reduction of director terms to two years, item five, for an advisory vote regarding the reduction of director terms to one year, and item six, for an advisory vote regarding additional reporting on diversity and inclusion efforts. While over 99% of shares present are entitled to vote on, on item two, did so as recommended by the board, Unfortunately, less than 66.7% of our total outstanding shares, which were required to approve this item, 
submitted votes for this item. After the final tabulation is completed, we will formally announce the results by, uh, of the voting by filing a Form 8K within four business days of today's meeting. That concludes the official business of today's shareholder meeting, which is now adjourned. Okay. We will now move into company's update presentation by Elon. Please go to the website www.tesla.com slash 2021 shareholder meeting in order to watch the presentation. During the course of the following session, we may discuss our business outlook and make other forward-looking statements. Such statements are prediction based on our current expectations. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties including those disclosed in our most recent Form 10Q filed with the SEC. Such forward-looking statements uh, represent our view as of today, should not be relied on then after, and as we disclaim any obligation to update them after today. With that, please welcome Elon Musk. Welcome to the annual shareholder meeting. Um, coming to you live from Austin, Texas. So um, we've had a fantastic year. Uh, thanks to the great work of the Tesla team. Um, I'd just like to start off by just thanking the Tesla team for the incredible work over the past year to get where, where we are. Well then. <laughs> so. We have uh, record vehicle deliveries, um, as uh, we've already reported this. Uh, but you can see that there's a pretty, um, I mean, I, it's, I think this might be the fastest that any large manufactured object has grown. Like, um, yeah, it's certainly one of the fastest, perhaps the fastest. Um, and um, it looks like we, we have a good chance of maintaining that into the future, uh, really dependent on um, Supplier challenges. So if if, we, if uh, we're basically if we can get the chips, <laughs> we can do it. Um, so uh, hopefully this chip shortage will alleviate soon. But um, I feel confident um, of being able to maintain something like this at least above 50% for quite a while. The Model 3 became the best-selling premium vehicle uh, globally. So if any premium vehicle. Uh, But I, I mean, I almost got arrested at one point for claiming that we'd do 5,000 a week, literally. <laughs> You're laughing now. Um, anyway, this is great. Um, we think the Model Y will be uh, the best-selling vehicle of uh, any kind globally. So we think it will, it will exceed the Model 3. Um, I think we've got a good chance of it being the best-selling vehicle by revenue next year, and then I think quite likely to be the best-selling vehicle uh, in just of, of any kind numerically in in 23 uh, in 2023. So uh, basically, we need we need uh, Austin to get online and Berlin to get online and reach volume production, and then I think that's going to happen. Um, a cash in terms of free cash flow generation. 
Um, obviously, we had uh, some tough years uh, back then. Um, things were looking a little dicey, to say the least, in 2017 and 2018. <sighs> uh, <laughs> don't want to go back there again. Um, but uh, we, we got through that, and now things are looking uh, really good. So I think we'll see continued uh, strong cash flow generation, uh, and uh, especially uh, it, as you multiply unit volume times autonomy uh, and increased efficiency in the factories. Um, uh, it, because I, I think over time, you'll see all manufacturers will make electric vehicles, and eventually, <laughs> all manufacturers will make autonomous vehicles. Um, and we, I think and we, and Tesla's open to licensing uh, autonomy because I think autonomy will be uh, such a significant lifesaver and preventer of injuries that it, it is not a technology we want to keep to ourselves. So um, I think it will be um, morally right to, to license it to other manufacturers if they would like to, to use it. So. Um, and of course, uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress on, on cost reduction. Um, and uh, so despite our average selling price actually going down significantly because with the introduction of the Model 3 and Model Y, these were much lower priced cars, uh, we've managed to still do uh, decently well on, on gross margin. So this is, um, you know, get, getting the average price down and, and gross margin up is, is very difficult, uh, but we've managed to, to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's good. Um, our goal really is to make the cars as affordable as possible. Um, we are seeing significant cost pressure in our supply chain, um, and uh, so we've had to increase um, uh, vehicle prices, uh, at least temporarily, but we do hope to actually reduce the prices over time and make them more affordable. Uh, so. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we've, got, we've just expedited. Like, I mean, the sheer amount of money we're spending on um, flying parts around the world is, is uh, it's just not, not great, but hopefully temporary. So, and we need a lot of batteries. Uh, hence, uh, battery day is what this shirt means. Very obtuse. Um, but um, we are going to need a lot of batteries. And this is going to be um, a combination of batteries from our suppliers. Um, and in, in supplier discussions, um, you know, some of our suppliers have just asked me outright, are, are we going to just, you know, put them out of business or something? I'm like, not at all. As many cells as you want to make and supply to us at an affordable price, we will buy. No limit. I'm like, oh, okay. So, like, do you want to have, yeah, increase by 100%? Sounds good to me. Um, so, the, the basic plan is uh, we're, we're really going to order a lot of, and we have ordered a lot of batteries from suppliers, basically telling suppliers literally uh, uh, go, go as much as you can make, we'll take. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll prioritize uh, batteries for vehicles, but then use um, any excess uh, cells that we have in the Powerwall and Megapack. Uh, because uh, over time, we think the demand for stationary storage is going to be at least as high as the demand for vehicles. So. Uh, sustainable energy, primarily solar and wind, is intermittent. And so the wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't shine all the time, obviously. Um, and so you need batteries to buffer that power. Um, so the, the fundamental pillars of a sustainable energy future are uh, basically solar and wind, those are the primary, ba uh, stationary batteries and electric transport. And if you have those three, then you have a sustainable energy future as long as the sun, the sun is shining. You know? So sometimes people ask me about fusion. And I like it as an idea. And by the way, I think it's totally doable. Um, but uh, there's a giant fusion reactor in the sky that shows up every morning, and zero maintenance. Um, so I'm like, so it sounds like a good deal, you know? Uh, we'll just catch a little bit of that sunlight and uh, power Earth. Um, a, sh a shockingly small amount of land is needed to power Earth. <laughs> it's like, you know, a, a couple hundred miles uh, by a couple hundred miles of solar panels will power the entire United States. So I was like, okay, it's not that hard. Um, and then I believe we calculated you only needed one square mile of batteries. So you may think like, wow, a lot of batteries. One square mile of batteries, it's not that crazy. So anyway, um, 
So we've got, we've got a plan to uh, reduce the cost per kilowatt hour of batteries. Um, and, um, and our suppliers, you know, have similar plans. Uh, so this is um, really supplemental to our suppliers. Um, we'll make cells, they'll make cells, we'll use them all. Um, the, the fundamental good of Tesla, I think, is um, by how many years did we accelerate sustainable energy? This is the, the fundamental, I think, uh, way to think of the, the value of Tesla. And so if we are able to accelerate sustainable energy by more years, that is good. Um, hence the need to grow quickly. Uh, we've got three new factories. Um, Giga Shanghai has done an incredible job. Um, and uh, Giga Shanghai now exceeds uh, Fremont uh, in production. So actually, I'd like to just give a special hand to the uh, Tesla China team. Right. So it's the, the best quality, lowest cost, and, uh, and also low drama. So it's great. Um, and um, we, but that said, we are um, continuing to expand our Fremont uh, operations um, and uh, expect to uh, hopefully increase Fremont output by 50%. So, and that's still where we make all Model S and Xs are made in, in Fremont. Um, but uh, it kind of makes sense, especially for the high volume vehicles, to have production that's at least on the continent where the consumers are. Um, otherwise, it's just it's also not good for the environment to be shipping cars, you know, several thousand miles. So the basic idea is have the high volume vehicles be where the customers are, approximately at least. <laughs> um, and then uh, also great progress with building Giga Texas, which is where we are right now, uh, and Giga Berlin Brandenburg. So just a hand for those teams as well. Um, and and the, um, th these factories uh, will have cell production uh, in them as well. So this will be really kind of raw materials in, cars out. So really, really big. Um, yeah. I mean, these things will be in like units of Pentagon, basically. Uh, let's see. So impact report. Um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, interesting stuff in our impact report. Um, we go into uh, I think quite a lot of detail on um, all the things we're doing. Um, and you know, uh, uh, Tesla is, is, is certainly a company that uh, tries very hard to do the right thing in all respects. We try very hard to do the right thing in all respects. We don't always succeed. But if you're looking for a company where you can say, is that company really trying to do the right thing? That is Tesla. <laughs> OK, we really try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, uh, anyway, so, uh, um, so uh, as I was mentioning, we've got the you know three parts of a sustainable energy future: uh, solar and wind. But I think primarily solar will be the the main source of energy uh, of sustainable energy and energy in general. Um, and then you need. Uh, uh, to store that energy with uh, stationary battery packs, and then you need um, electric vehicles and uh, electric airplanes and boats and whatnot. So, um, yeah, great. Um, yeah, and then uh, the, the uh, average life cycle emissions in the US, uh, this is only going to get better as, as we move to a sustainable energy grid um, and, and electric vehicles then obviously we move to a fully sustainable energy economy, which is where we want to get to as quickly as possible. The sooner the better. And can, can there be a carbon tax? I mean, what the hell, you know? Um, so people sometimes say like, oh, carbon tax, that would benefit Tesla. I'm like, yeah, but it would, it would uh, hurt SpaceX. Uh, so how about the carbon tax, <laughs> which is really needed, so. Um, See, battery materials are uh, definitely encyclable. Burden gas is not. Uh, CO2 is an extremely stable molecule. Um, Mars's atmosphere has been primarily CO2 for know, billions of years. Uh, it's extremely stable. Um, 
So sometimes people worry about methane. Uh, do not worry too much about methane. Methane quickly breaks down into CO2. Methane is not a stable molecule. CO2 is extremely stable. Um, so, um, and of course, you can recycle battery materials. So it, uh, you can think of batteries as essentially high-grade ore. So you can either get your lithium and your nickel or, and, and the various constituents of the battery from uh, rocks or from batteries. It's much better to get them from batteries. So uh, batteries are basically high-grade ore. And um, Tesla has already started recycling, and there are lots of companies that are going to do recycling because it, it basically pays to do recycling for batteries. So um, we're seeing, you know, um, increased uh, extreme weather events, and uh, there's like wildfires. And here in Austin, there was a massive snowstorm that turned the power off. I was actually in Austin for that uh, snowstorm in a house with uh, no electric, no lights, no power, no heating, no internet. Couldn't actually even get to a food store. If you could get to a food store, there was no food there. That went on for several days. Um, uh, however, if we had the solar plus power wall, uh, it, the car would have had lights and electricity, and actually, if you had a Starlink internet, you'd have internet too. So, um, all the things you need for a prepper, <laughs> basically. <laughs> if doomsday comes, yeah, it could be helpful. Um, so, in factory safety, we've done, we've made uh, huge improvements on, on factory safety. Um, so. Uh, we're now 18% better than the industry average, so this is a this is great. Uh, it, it's always tough with safety as you ramp production lines and as you start up factories, but then as as the, once it's in steady state, then the injuries naturally de naturally decline because people get used to it and you iron out the issues. And so we're seeing um, excellent uh, factory safety uh, in, at Tesla, um, and we, we're, we're, our goal is to have the safest factory on earth. And then uh, AI Day, I think it was important to uh, change the fundamental perception of, of Tesla because people do, they sort of think of Tesla as a car company, and yes, we make cars, um, but, but, at, but the AI portion, part of Tesla was not well understood. Um, I, Tesla is as much a software company as it is a hardware company. And, um, and, and, as, and we also do the, the chips. Uh, so we designed the... Uh, the full self-driving inference computer. Uh, we're designing a training computer that's going to be able to, we think, be the most efficient uh, neural net training computer in the world by far. Um, and um, and we're, we're seeing a tremendous response. So daily applicants by <laughs> role. Um, as you can see, it's basically, uh, you know, on the y-axis there. <laughs> and, and then after AI day, that's uh, the AI applicants increased dramatically. So I thought that was a very successful day. The team did a great job. Um, and um, yeah, um, AI is going to be a very important part of the future. Uh, Self-driving is obviously one of the functions. Um, and um, I obviously have mixed thoughts about AI. And we've got to watch out for AI being a danger. Uh, but it's happening either way, so I guess if we help do it, we can try our best to make sure it is a positive, you know, good, good AI, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, I'm excited to announce that we're moving our headquarters to Austin, Texas. So um, just to, to be clear, though, we will be continuing to expand our activities in California. So this is not a matter of, of sort of Tesla leaving California. Um, as I said, we're, we're, our, our intention is to actually increase output uh, from Fremont and from uh, Giga Nevada by 50 percent. So, but we're just, we're just hitting the sides of the bowl, at the, you know. Um, I mean, if you go to our Fremont factory, it is jammed. I mean, it is. Yeah, it's like, whoa. <laughs> and when we first went in there, it was, it was like, you know, 
we're, we're like a, a kid in his parents' shoes. It was ridiculous, like tiny S and giant factory. And now we're like, yes, ma'am, and I can here. Like, <laughs> how do we fit more stuff? Um, and and it's, it, it, it's, it's tough for people to afford houses, and a lot of people have to come in from far away. And so it's, uh, we'll, we'll take, you know, we're taking it as far as, as possible, but it's, um, there's a limit to how, uh, how big you can scale in, in the Bay Area. So um, w uh, here um, in, in Austin, and our, you know, our factory is like five minutes from the airport, 15 minutes from downtown. Um, and uh, we're going to create an ecological paradise here on the car, because uh, we're right on the Col Colorado River. It's going to be great. So um, to emphasize gain, continuing to expand in California significantly, um, but, but, um, but even more so uh, here in Texas. So um, with that, we can go to questions. Uh, okay, so uh, when will Cybertruck production begin and at what rate will the ramp up happen? Um, well, um, so the, the, this year has been just a, a constant struggle with, with parts supply. Um, so just to be clear, if, if we had like five extra products, we would not change our vehicle output at all uh, because we were just basically limited by multiple supply chain shortages, like so many supply chain, uh, of so many types, not just chips. There were lots of supply chain shortages. Um, so the, I, uh, so it really wouldn't matter if we had like the semi or the cyber truck or anything, we would just not be able to make it. Um, and the semi in particular uh, needs a lot of cells. So it needs a lot of cells, a lot of chips. And so uh, that will be, uh, we, we got to have enough, otherwise it's pointless. So I think most likely what we'll see is cyber truck start production and the next year. Uh, and then reach volume production in 2023. And um, hopefully we can also be producing the semi and the, uh, the new roadster in 23 as well. Um, so we should be through our severe supply chain shortages uh, in 23. I'm optimistic that that will be the case. Uh, let's see, <laughs> will we do a stock split? Um, well, we, maybe not yet. Um, maybe we'll consider a stock split, split at some point in the future, but um, I, I think we'll not quite do that quite yet. Uh, will we see 46.8 battery cell production in Texas? Um, I, d I don't think we will see 46.80 production in Texas this year, uh, but we are making um, 46.80s in California. Um, at a, our pilot plant, which is a big plant by normal standards. It's like a capable of 10 gigawatt hours a year. So um, it's, just, it's just a mile away from our vehicle factory in Fremont. So it's um, that, that basically the, the, that, that factory will be able to make more than enough cells for uh, Giga Texas to, to scale production of Model Y. Um, and um, I do want to emphasize, like, the, from the point at which a factory is able to start making cars to where it reaches uh, high volume production is typically about a year, and that's considered very fast. So um, it's a uh, it, it it takes longer, it, or at least in, in in Tesla land, it takes longer to build the factory than it does to reach volume production once the factory is built. Um, so. Like uh, in Shanghai, we built the factory in 11 months, but to, to get to high volume production took about a year. Um, and so I expect something similar here. You know, we'll, we'll start production uh, this year and we'll deliver, I'm confident we'll deliver some uh, cars from Giga Texas this year, model wise, but uh, we won't reach high volume production until probably the end of next year. Um, so, uh, but then I also expect we will reach high volume production in the 4680 cell here in. Giga Texas uh, next year as well. <laughs> More factories. Um, man, it's hard to build a factory. Um, yeah, I've said many times that prototypes are easy, production is hard. Uh, like, you know, or whatever, it's like 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. But I think for high volume production, it's like 99% perspiration. Um, so, uh, hmm. 
I think we'll, we'll, I mean, we might start scouting for locations next year, but I think we, we can do a lot with um, Berlin and, um, you know, Berlin and Austin and ex expanding in China, uh, you know, so, and expanding in Fremont. So, um, the nice thing is like having at least a factory in Europe and a factory in China, a factory in North America, we at least have um, factories where, for our high volume products where, uh, that are on the continent where most of our customers are. This is great. So we do not, like one of the biggest challenges we had in Q3 was can we get enough ships? <laughs> like there was a huge ship shortage. Um, so that was, that was a challenge. And that boat that got stuck in the Panama, uh, no, I mean the Suez Canal, um, <laughs> caused havoc. So, you know, these things, you don't expect these things, um, but they happen. Um, so, I don't know, we'll look, probably look at uh, new factory locations, start to investigate them next year, maybe make a decision um, in 23. Does Tesla plan to offer dividends? Uh, we don't currently have plans for dividends. Um, I, d I do kind of feel like the time when a company offers dividends is, you know, it's kind of cresting the hill, you know, um, <laughs> if you will. It's not, usually not, they've run out of things to invest internally. Uh, in, you know, we've not run out of things to invest in internally by a long shot. So. Uh, can we provide a quarterly update on energy along with automotive? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we need to make more progress on energy. Um, the, you know, the, we, we, yeah, this year has been limited, like I said, the, the chip shortage, the same chips go into our ba stationary battery packs as in the cars, and we prioritize the cars. So, um, you know, and we need the inverters for solar and, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, this year has not been a good guide for uh, progress in energy. I think next year it will be probably a good guide and we can start providing uh, updates that I think people would inter interpret correctly as opposed to, you know, having to explain, well, we either had to short cars or, um, or energy and we picked cars. So, all right. Yeah, Model 2 is not a car. <laughs> There's no, no Model 2. <laughs> the 3 means E. Um, so we're, we're, we're model three. We try to do get the we're going to call it the model E, but then four threatened to sue us, and so we said, "Well, let's call it the model three, you know." Um, so it's S three X Y instead of you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, Gigafactory is getting bigger with each iteration. Um, not, not all gigafactories will get bigger with each iteration, I think, uh, but uh, yeah, most of them will. They, they'll, they'll get more advanced and more efficient. Um, and you're looking at sort of taking a first principles approach to manufacturing. Uh, you want to look at the volumetric efficiency of, of a factory um, and the, the average speed of a factory. It's kind of like the, the, the rocket equation. Um, where delta V is like exhaust velocity times the log of the start to uh, end mass ratios. Um, so uh, I think it's something similar uh, to that for a factory. Um, and you can also think of it like a chip. Um, like do you make chips, um, get more out of chips by making them bigger or by bringing things closer together and increasing the clock speed? And actually, I think there's tremendous opportunity in factories to actually bring things closer together and increase the, the, the cycle time, um, the clock speed. Um, and uh, there's actually, I think, tremendous opportunity to improve the efficiency of factories. And Tesla's long-term competitive advantage will be uh, manufacturing. Because um, all cars will be electric, eventually all cars will be autonomous. Um, the thing that's the hardest to, I think, uh, sort of match Tesla on or copy is manufacturing. And so I think that will be the long-term advantage of Tesla. Uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, limiting factor to growth is um, engineering. Yeah, there's, there's really not a like factory stamping out amazing engineers. Um, so it's hard to, you know, you, you've got to basically recruit people, you've got to kind of like train them in the right way, um, and this just takes time. Um, and uh, it, it, like sometimes companies think you could just hire anyone with an engineering degree, slap them together, and get amazing stuff. This is not, not the case at all. Um, often adding more engineering engineers to a program uh, makes it go slower. So, um, you know, and, and the excellence of an engineer matters tremendously. There are the huge differences in engineering talent uh, that are boggles the mind. Um, but I, I do wonder today, like, if Nikola Tesla applied to Tesla, would we even give him an, an interview? <laughs> I'm not sure we would. You know? It's like, it was like you know, we should, obviously. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that does concern me. Like, I think we, we could do a better job of, um, of, of vetting resumes. And, and really, we're just looking for evidence of exceptional ability. Like, not whether somebody graduated from a particular school or whatever. Um, but, like, just three bullet points, uh, evidence of exceptional ability. Um, and, and do you say, wow, if you read those three bullet points, then great. That, that should be the approach. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually a big fan of the original uh, VW uh, sort of bust. Um, that was really cool. Um, and uh, I haven't really seen the new one, but um, yeah, I mean, I think over time Tesla will make basically, you know, all, all major variants of vehicle. Um, why not, you know? Um, one in every significant category, I think. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so, so from, I guess can, people can see these slides, right? So I'll just, no need to read the question. Um, yeah, I think we're actually making a rapid progress with solar roof. Um, uh, you know, um, solar, so, solar in general and energy in general got kind of uh, short change for a couple of years there because we we're desperately trying to make the Model 3 and, and reach volume production. So we just moved everyone from anywhere in the company that could possibly work on Model 3 was working on Model 3. It was all hands on deck, as you know. So there's just a couple of years where we just, you know, if just if we got to save, if, if Model 3 fails, the whole company's dead. So we just could move everyone from solo from everywhere to help with Model 3. Um, so we're a couple of years behind on that. But um, we, I think we're now making rapid progress with uh, the solar roof and um, in particular with uh, new home builders. Um, Obviously, the most efficient uh, way to get a solar roof is to put it on, uh, you know, put a roof on once, um, instead of, um, you know, it, it, like doing retrofit is obviously fundamentally more expensive than just than, than doing solar roof on new homes. So, um, we now have relationships with a number of new home builders, and um, and we expect that those to to gather significant momentum, um, and. Um, and then we're going to have a campaign, which is uh, kind of like, well, I'm dating myself here. I want my MTV. Um, so I want my solar roof. <laughs> Where is it? So, um, you know, I think we'll just get people actively asking in new home developments, well, does it have a solar roof and a power wall? And, you know, because then, you know, you, you, gener you, you, you generate your own power and um, you can help stabilize the rest of the grid using the power wall. Um, and we're doing this in partnership with utilities. Like the thing that I think um, people need to appreciate is that there's a, a lot more electricity production that needs to occur as we move to an, uh, an electric vehicle future. Um, for for two homes where both cars are electric, um, the power electricity usage will approximately double. And so, if you don't have local 
power production at the homes um, with a battery, because the battery's got to buffer the power. Um, otherwise, you, if, 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 you just have so, if, if you just have solar without batteries, it, it causes these massive waves in the grid. Um, uh, and, and so you have to have the batteries to stabilize the, the, the grid. But those batteries can then act collectively to stabilize the whole grid. Um, and that's software that, that we've developed that is, um, I think, first going to go into use in Australia. Um, that's going to be, I think, quite compelling. But you really need, um, for a sustainable energy future, you have to address uh, uh, electricity at the, at the homeowner level. This is essential. Um, but there will still be a very prosperous future for utilities because uh, electric power will approximately double. And then if you transition heating to electric as well, it approximately triples. So this is a lot of work, both at the local level of electricity distribution and at the utilities. Utilities got to expand, and there's got to be um, solar uh, and, and batteries at the homeowner level. Um, but ha having a Tesla solar with, with, with battery means that you have power no matter what. If the utility shuts you off or does, for any reason, you still have power. Um, when I was here in the in the Austin blizzard, it's like I was staying at a friend's house, but he didn't have the solar roof and battery, so I'm sitting in the dark, uh, in the cold, and I was like, this, okay, we're really, really brings home the need for the solar roof and battery. Um, so anyway, so I think that's uh, going to see, I think solar roof will see massive growth in the years to come. Uh, yeah, 10.2 is going out tomorrow night. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, this is too much inside baseball on FSD, but uh, the, um, we're going to start rolling out um, the FSD beta to um, all customers with a perfect uh, safety driving record um, tomorrow night at midnight California time, and um, then we'll see how that goes, and we want to be very cautious about the rollout. Um, if that's looking good, then we'll, because um, there's like a little over a thousand people that have a perfect score, uh, then we'll you know, start giving it to people with a 99, 90, 98, 97, and so forth. Um, we'll probably have to have some cutoff, you know, where it's like 60%, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's, it's got to be, um, we're, we're looking for people who, who are extremely conscientious uh, drivers for the beta program. Um, so, but it's looking really good. Um, I actually drove here from, from my, the friend's house I'm staying at in Austin, um, which is quite far away and has quite a complicated drive. Um, and the car took me all the way from um, my friend's house to the Gigafactory with no interventions. So perfect drive. Yeah. All right, is that, are those all the questions? Or I guess we'll take some from, yeah, audience? Uh, sure. Or you can just yell or whatever, I don't know. Hey. Oh, uh, when will we not need to do any more mining for batteries? Yeah. Um, basically, it'll be a while because we've got to um, extend the fleet. So the fleet of cars out there is gigantic. There's about two billion cars and trucks uh, in use in the world. Um, and uh, so uh, that's, that's a lot. So um, uh, annual global capacity for vehicles is 100 million a year, roughly, um, which kind of makes sense. Like cars and trucks tend to last about 20 years before they go to the junkyard. Um, so, so that's impor an important statistic to bear in mind. Like even if all cars were, and all vehicles were electric tomorrow, it would still take 20 years to um, ch change out the fleet. Um, so I, I think people don't, so like, pe you see a lot of noise and sort of stories about electric vehicles, but the fleet is what matters. Um, and the, and so, um, it's basically rounds down to nothing. <laughs> if you look at total fleet of vehicles on Earth, and electric cars at this point, I think, are still well under 1% of the fleet. So. But I don't know, it, probably 30 years-ish, 30, 40 years? Yeah, it's not bad. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, and I think um, uh, just to clarify a few things that are sometimes misunderstood out there. Um, uh, lithium is extremely plentiful. It is one of the most plentiful things on Earth. It is not rare at all. Um, it's hard to avoid lithium. <laughs> if you said, well, where can we dig a bunch of rock that doesn't have some lithium in it, you would have a hard time. <laughs> um, it's in seawater, in, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's basically lithium, lithium is a salt. So where is the salt? There's a little bit of salt pretty much everywhere. So it's lithium everywhere. Um, so that's not, not an issue. Also, lithium is only like maybe one or two percent of the cell. Um, and so the actual thing that matters is the cathode. Um, and uh, I, it, it, um, most of our, well, well actually, our, our higher, our long range vehicles use a nickel based cathode. And uh, you know, sometimes people think it's a, ca a cobalt based cathode. No, cobalt is used in phones and, and laptops, but uh, we use nickel because nickel has higher energy density for our long range uh, vehicles. Um, but for our standard range vehicles and for stationary storage, I think all of that will move to iron based. Uh, uh, iron cathodes, and I, iron is also extremely plentiful. Uh, nic the nickel is not rare, but uh, th there's, uh, I don't know, somewhere maybe 10 to 100 times more in iron than there is nickel. So, um, so, th so moving to, to an iron-based uh, uh, chemistry, um, which is sort of finally at the point where it's, it's competitive on range when combined with uh, an efficient powertrain, uh, I think that will be the the vast majority of, of factories in the future will be iron-based. So I do not see any shortages. Um, it's just a question of making all the equipment to kind of process that into a cell and then into a pack. Yeah. Oh, off-planet factory. I like the way you think. So, where, how many years before Tesla's first off-planet factory? I mean, I, I mean, I'd like to see one before in bed. That would be cool. Um, so I don't know, if, what have we got? Like, forty years ish. Uh, hopefully before mm, dead, basically. <laughs> That'd be great. What's my safety score? Oh, great question. Um, I don't know, actually. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is. I'll check. Uh, I'll check when, because I think it's, uh, mine just got turned on. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, good, 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 I'll find out. <laughs> Uh, by the way, a safety score calculation is obviously imperfect. That's why we try to emphasize very much that it is beta, if not alpha, in, in safety score calculation. Um, so it's going to get um, a lot of changes. Uh, yeah, expected to imp in, improve in its accuracy substantially over time. This is really just, it's a very early stage algorithm. Oh, is there anything we can do with the grid system here? Uh, yeah, um, in fact, uh, Tesla is doing um, a number of projects in Tesla, in, in Texas, uh, Tesla, Texas. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, we've, we've got a, a large battery project, um, I believe, uh, in the Houston area. Yeah, it's Houston area. Um, sorry? But, yeah, we're doing 100 megawatts in the Houston area. Um, and. Um, we're, we're talking to ERCOT about uh, doing uh, other major installations. Um, the, the, the Tesla um, Megapack system can, is, is actually really great at, at dealing with power fluctuations. So if you look at uh, power usage, uh, it's, it varies dramatically during the day. So you get, um, you know, uh, it, particularly on a, on a summer day or, or a winter, winter day, if you've got electric heating um, or electric cooling, um, then you're going to see big, big spikes on hot or cold days. Um, and um, so, so just even during the day, you see big, big variances, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then from from when, like, 
you know, in order for, for a power, if a power grid has no, no uh, sort of energy storage buffer, then it's, it's as resilient as the worst second of the worst day of the worst year. So this is not, that's obviously not great. Uh, and you, they sort of, they'll throw Pico plants in there, but if the Pico plant is, is reliant on natural gas, and, you, and then people start using natural gas for heating, which is kind of what happened in, in Austin, people were using the gas to heat, then the Pico plants didn't have the gas. And like, uh, okay, but batteries w w would work great. So um, if, if there'd been Tesla Megapacks here during the blizzard, the power would not have gone out. Uh, target capacity for the, the, the Megapack factory. Um, no, I don't actually know what the target capacity is, but it's big. <laughs> 40 gigawatt hours. Okay, 40 gigawatt hours. Um, yeah. Um, act actually, that's an example of where we are expanding, uh, also where we're expanding manufacturing in California. So this is um, in, in Lathrop, uh, California. We just uh, uh, opened a big um, Megapack production facility. Sorry, it's difficult to hear. In te oh, Tesla Insurance. Uh, yeah, so, um, like, the, the degree in which insurance is uh, a regulatory labyrinth is insane. Um, it was, like, designed to be hard, is the feeling you got. I, mean, I don't know if it's designed, it, but it certainly is very difficult. Um, so, there's a zillion applications, and you have to wait for a bunch of time and get to, well, it's long, long and complicated, and a lot of it is state by state. Most of it is state by state. So, um, so we're just we're processing applications in states across the country, and um, and then the states also have different regulations. So you can't, you know, actually aren't legally allowed to offer the same insurance in every state. So you got to adjust the software to be different in every state. It's basically it's very complicated, <laughs> um, but I think. Um, We'll be offering it in, in Texas very soon, um, and like maybe in a month or something. Next week, Next week. great. Uh, phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so Tesla Insurance goes live in Texas next week, um, and um, I knew it was this month, but uh, and then uh, we have it in California. We're going to be upgrading the version in California because um, in California we, we want to have the same kind of real-time insurance that where your insurance costs are based on your actual driving history, um, which is like the, the right way to do it. Um, but okay, we're currently not allowed to do that in California for some reason. Um, we, we're, so we're trying to get permission from the regulators to be allowed to give accurate scores for insurance. It seems like that's the thing you'd want to do. Um, and, um, and then hopefully, I don't know, we'll probably have most of the country next year aspirationally. That's our goal. <laughs> give it, give it, give it. We're really getting into the weeds here. Um, so we're definitely going to be making Cybertruck here, um, and so probably the ATV too. So the, the ATV is an interesting design challenge because ATVs are pretty dangerous, and so we want to make an ATV that is th the least dangerous ATV. So if you're going to ATV, well, you might as well have the least dangerous ATV, you know. So it'll have a really low center of gravity because the battery pack will be down low, and. I think we can do some things with the suspension. It just make it really hard to roll this thing, you know. So it'll because when ATVs roll is when bad things happen. <laughs> so it's going to be the ATV that won't roll. <laughs> uh, so it'll be cool. Uh, you you got to have one with a Cybertruck, you know. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, that, I'll take one last question. Yeah. Oh, oh, what about electric planes? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we have a lot on our plate here. Um, but electric planes, um, yeah, I've been dying to do that for a decade, you know, honestly. But uh, we, we, got, uh, we got quite a few fish to fry here. Um, so maybe one day, maybe one day the electric plane. Um, I mean, battery energy density is improving um, every year, so that's an important uh, important metric to get the cell energy density to 
um, around 450, 500 watt hours per kilogram, um, and have it at, have a pack efficiency around 400 watt hours per kilogram. That's when uh, electric planes start to get to get interesting. So uh, I don't know, it'd be a fun problem to work on at some point. Um, but uh, just we, we got we got a lot to do over the next few years. So we're going to focus on the, these things, get them right, and then maybe one day do that. Uh, all right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks for being here. Right. Howdy, gang. Howdy, gang. Let me turn my face back on. Howdy, gang. Howdy, gang. Hello, my friends. Boop. Oh, that was fun, wasn't it? If you got any questions, slap them in the chat. We'll hang out for a few more minutes. This ran, obviously, uh, quite a bit longer than I was expecting, but that was great. What a slow start but it eventually got there. It eventually got there. By the way, I don't know if any of the other streams managed to ever get around to fixing the audio. Um, that was complicated. I had to go into some deep menus to, to manually adjust gain uh, beyond the whole thing. Uh, figure it out. I don't know, man. Yeah. Andy, uh, you're welcome. The audio... Uh, that's why I was planning the whole time on doing notes, uh, but I did not do them because I had to manage the audio. And that's fine. I'm happy to do that if that's what helps. Uh, so let's see. <laughs> Cyber quad with fold-out solar panels. Mm, why not? I like it. That's a good idea. Uh, what else we got? Uh, I just wanted to see the prices come down and not up. So I assume you mean on the, the re, do you mean on the, um, on the retail price to consumers? Um, something we talked about a little bit ago was that uh, the way it's going to work is as long as the demand is strong, keep it high. Because if we're talking a million units a year, $1,000 extra is a billion extra to the bottom line, which is what Giga Shanghai Phase 1 cost to build. So if you could build a whole new Giga Shanghai Phase 1, for just the premium from just one year of excess um, demand over supply, do it. Do it. Howdy, Paul. Howdy, Larry. Let's see. Let me uh, see if I can grab a chat here and pop it out. So you can see what I'm doing. Pop it right here. Why not? Make it a little bigger. Okay. Jump over here, make sure I'm not looking crazy. Only a little crazy. Uh ha -huh ha -huh ha -huh. ha. Yeah, much good stuff, much good stuff. Um, Crumb Research, you're welcome. Welcome aboard. I do not believe I have seen you around before. Welcome <laughs> to my Tesla weekend. What else, what else? Ah. Uh, yeah, Michael, who does need a different stream when you got mine? I'm telling you guys, I am the best kept secret on YouTube. Howdy, Eros. Uh, fun, but coy about capacity of new factories. So Elon has a history of promising the stars and only delivering the moon. And uh, investors don't care for that. <clears throat> uh, so I think that's the, the crazy one. Uh, a comment that came in a little bit ago, um, Michael, the biggest FU to states that won't allow direct sales in reference to, yeah, let's sell them. If you won't let Tesla sell direct, do what they did in New Mexico and go straight to the reservations, to the autonomous nations that exist within the United States. Do dat. Do dat. Uh, did he say when production will start in Texas? 
No, he did not. But the answer is imminently. We we may see some deliveries in Q4, uh, but it's the the trial production has already begun. How about Tesla wheelchairs integrated with the vehicles where driver's seat does double duty and base drivers? So that is Captain Walker. That is fantastic. So one thing we were talking about kind of earlier, kind of on the side that I don't know if it, I don't know how many of you watched the chat was the van could double as a boring tunnel um, shuttle. The same form factor could be used and that form factor would be ideal for a mobility uh, ready vehicle. It'd be ideal for it because the floor is so low. You could come in from two, three different sides. You could come in from the sides or the back. Oh, oh, that's a good one. I might have to think on that one. I might have to think on that. I like it. I thought for sure they would say production had started. I thought they were going to too. I was expecting, I'm always expecting a, oh, and one more thing moment, which is for the record, the worst Columbo impression that has ever been made. Thanks for arranging this, Jim Walker says. I liked it. I also had access to the Tesla stream, but I enjoyed reading the comments from your viewers. Thank you, Jim. And also, my volume was better than theirs because they can build cores, but they can't balance audio. So that's apparently a thing. Elon said Cybertruck production may start late next year with volume production in 2023. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. That's frustrating. Uh, Rachel Lynn, watching from Tampa. Hello. I have been to Tampa once. It was for work. I only got to leave my hotel to go to work. I assume there's more to the city than that. Josh says, best stream. I agree. I agree. It's the only one I watched. Uh, Tesla should make a factory for government vehicles and specialized cars. Um, maybe, 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 maybe. Well, the one more thing was that they're moving their headquarters to Texas. Yes, but we kind of knew that when they put out uh, the press release the other day, the quarterly figures, and the um, and the city was listed as uh, Texas rather than Palo Alto which was kind of surprising. I think the headquarters is going to be in the area on the west side of the highway. There's a little uh, emerald footprint over there that you can see. That's not a square. That's a very sloppy triangle, kind of. But uh, no, the um, I think that's where the headquarters is going to be. Did you think that was a, was a bullish or bearish uh, meeting in terms of the stock? So I thought it was bullish, which means it's bearish. I'm always excited. I always see the best in these things and they always seem great and they never move the stock in the direction I would expect. We crushed the Q3 numbers from even the highest Wall Street analysts. Nothing exciting happened from it. Nothing exciting happened from it. Can't wait for Tesla insurance in Florida. I had no idea auto insurance was so convoluted. It's very strange to me, but that seems like a pretty American thing. I'm guessing the Terra Texas slash Berlin installed capacity will be 7 million. Um, I don't think so from phase one, from the current phases that we're seeing being built. I would guess just under a million each. But hey, man, that's fantastic. The big thing to me, I'm shocked. I was just sure that we were further along in the discussions about when we would see the next factory announced. I was just sure we were going to see it like, like now, like now, like, like we've, we're in final talks and we'll be announcing it soon. But I was mistaken as I have been a, in the past a few times. <laughs> Make government cars, but don't invite Biden. I don't understand the snub, but it's not a political channel, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna share my speculation because all the speculation's already out there, and mine would add nothing to it. 
Insurance companies are crooks. Uh, show me someone who loves their insurance company, and I'll show you someone who's never had to file a claim. Well, mine, I've got great insurance. It's so cheap. You ever needed it? You ever tried to file a claim? Well, no. What you have, my friend, is a monthly bill. So new factories will come in 2025 to 2027. That's the current speculation. I think we're, I still think we're going to see groundbreaking in 2022. At least an announcement. I really think that. Again, I have been wrong before. One thing I found mind-blowing, Tesla sold 39,000 vehicles in Europe in Q2. If Berlin can pump out 1,000 a week in Q4, that's an increase of 33%. I think European sales otherwise are limited by ships. So I think we're still going to see Model 3s coming out of Shanghai because I haven't heard plans for um, Berlin to, to have a Model 3 line at this time. So it could be even higher. Hmm... Supply chain kinks are slowing the factory search also. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Before another, oh, so Elon needs to operate the new factories first. Yes, that is a great point. Elon needs to operate the new factories first to see where improvements for the third gen factories can be made. Oh, you ever done that at work where you... Uh, have something new you're supposed to do and you're supposed to replicate it and you get all the way through and you finally and then you realize these oh I've got to change them all let's fix let's get the first one sorted out and then go they should move the headquarters to the south coast of the UK I could go to shareholder meetings car insurance in the UK is about 400 a year you Americans pay too much so I guess it depends on the car I pay I pay something stupid low. I have a 2016 Nissan Quest. It was about a $35,000 car. I paid like 16 for it. Um, it still has full coverage. And I want to say I pay less than 400 a year. Maybe a hair over it. I might, I might pay 500 a year for full coverage. So I don't know. But I'm old and slow and I don't drive much, so I don't know. I don't think they need new factories soon. If they're able to continually expand Berlin and Texas the same way that Shanghai is still growing, and that is a very good point, why would you need to build a new factory in the Rust Belt or uh, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina? Why would you need one if you've already got the land? And Austin, Austin isn't like uh, Sparks, slash Reno, where Giga Nevada is, where the labor and engineering pool is very shallow. Austin's a big market. You can get people there, you can find people there, and they've got the land. And Berlin is the same deal. They've got the land, and I believe the talent pool is sufficient. Oh. Unicornal Sarvi, Sarvi? Yeah, car insurance in UK is 400 a year. It's not 400 a year, it's 3,000 a year. Well, I think that comes back to what I was saying here is that there's, there's a range. There's a range. Pat says, my wife got in a non-fault accident that totaled our Camry. The insurance company gave us about 60% what the car was worth. Mm, that's frustrating. Yeah, I did have the best audio, didn't I? Mm. Best kept secret on, on YouTube, baby. Nobody's predictions beat mine. I don't know, man. I don't know. Berlin, 2 million. Texas, 3 million. Shanghai, 1 million. Fremont, 1 million. Shanghai, I think it's going to ramp past a million. Your other numbers could be pretty good. Pretty good. So, anything you want me to cover before we go? Because we're getting, we're getting on in the time here. We're getting on in the time. I, I just want to say real quick, thank you guys, all you crazy, crazy, clever robots for being here. And, uh, you know, here's my silly this thing. Uh, is it fit right? We'll find out. This is my Patreons who literally keep the channel running. Buck a month, ad-free experience, bonus material, early access, all that good stuff. 
I just appreciate you guys being here. Really, I do. Let me see if there's any more comments that need to be addressed. And, uh, you know, I see. I need to do this. Okay. Okay. Yes, best audio. They don't need extra frills. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This was... This was fun. It was exhausting. It was exhausting, but man, was it fun. Really appreciated it. You guys, um, I don't know, you make it fun. There will be a, a live stream tomorrow where we will be talking about, uh, what is it, um, that new shareholder meeting that uh, GM just held, which I think is comedy gold. So thank you guys so much. Thank you to Gary for the super chat. That was awesome. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's just keep moving on and moving forward, huh? All right. Just kind of holding for a second so that I don't cut off too prematurely. <laughs> 